and we'll get started. So if you're an achievement junkie, um, you know who you are. <laughs> I certainly am. Um, high achiever is something that is a lot of times just born in our DNA. Um, and we talk to a lot of women who feel like, hey, this is just me. I'm a type A personality. I'm an over an achiever. I've always been this way. This is how I'm wired. And there's this sense of that, you know, this is just who I am and everyone else around me is just going to have to deal with it. And here's the aftermath of what it's like to be a high achiever. Okay. That's not really true. Okay. Yes, you can have some genetic predisposition to being someone who's a high achiever, but most of this is environmental and it's cultural. And what's cool about that is once you recognize that, you can start to control it. You can start to have an impact on your environment um, because you don't have to necessarily be compulsed to achieve at all times. So I don't know if you're listening to this, but go ahead and give a like or um, a comment or whatever. If you've ever had a spouse or a friend or a parent tell you, why don't you just sit down and relax for a minute, right? Like uh, my husband used to say to me, like we, we, we'd get home and, and I'd say, you know, we need new flooring. So we get new flooring. I'd be like, oh, now we need new curtains. We get new curtains. Oh, that's sofa. We need a new sofa. Then we get new sofa and then we had to redo the backyard. And then, you know, he's like, <laughs> the first years of our marriage, he was like, can we just rest for a minute and enjoy this? Like he was like, what is the deal? So achievement junkies, we do not like to rest. We do not like to smell the roses. And what we do is we push and we push and we push ourselves to a point of burnout until we finally just collapse, which then gives us permission mentally, psychologically to take a little break. But we don't take a break long. We usually play hard or we usually sleep hard or whatever it is. And then we're right back to it. All right, so how do we break out of this achievement junkie, you know, mentality and where we're always an overachiever? Because truthfully, the sacrifices are huge. When we're younger and we have less on our plate, it seems like it's working for us and it does, right? In many cases, we have achieved great things in our careers. You may have gone up the corporate ladder very quickly, been promoted very quickly, been promoted past your peers. Um, taken on bigger projects than you know, those around you, more high profile projects, more prestigious projects. You're the person who gets chosen to do, you know, the special speaking presentation, et cetera, et cetera. But the downside of that is when do you actually get to enjoy your success, right? I can't tell you how many times I used to say in my career, when do I actually get to enjoy this? Because the minute I jumped through a hoop, there was five more hoops to jump through. Does anyone else feel that way? Okay. And I just didn't understand. I was like, why are there all these hoops to jump through? Like, when can I jump through the hoop and just be like, I've arrived? Like, this just feels good. And it never did. And initially, I was blaming the, the external environment around me. It was, you know, my boss was so demanding. It was my company that was so demanding. It was my, you know, my spouse, my dog, my kids, my neighbors. It was the house I lived in. It was, you know, maybe I need to downsize my house. Maybe I need to up-level my house. Maybe, you know. There was just all this stuff that I kept looking for to give me permission to rest. But the only person that's putting these hoops out in front of us is ourselves, okay? And if you recognize this in yourself, if you say, I'm a type A you know, achiever, if I'm an overachiever, then you know this about yourself, whether or not you're willing to admit it. I certainly wasn't for a long, long time. And I certainly didn't realize that I was creating the downside, right? I got that my achievement personality worked really well for me in the success factor, um, on the success side of things, I didn't get that it was burning me out. I thought that was everyone else's fault, right? I thought it was ever the environment that I was in. Well, if I have a different job, if I have a different company. And we talk with women all the time, you know, they'll book a call with us and we do these um, calls where we kind of work with you to create a game plan of what really needs to happen to help you as an achiever create balance and create the good life so you can enjoy it. And over and over again, women will start that call and they'll be like, Kate, you don't understand. I work in XYZ division and we're under-resourced. Got it. And then someone else will say, okay, you don't understand my industry. It's dominated by blah, blah, blah. Oh, you don't understand, Kate. I'm on the internal facing and we don't have many resources. Got it. Oh, you don't understand. It's, I'm in a client facing role. Got it. Like, you don't understand. Our company just went through a reorg. I mean, it's just like over and over again. It's like, I, I can just like write all these things down in bullet points. And it, it's not about your environment. It's just not. It's just not. Environments leaders, managers, whether you're in a toxic environment, whether you work for an amazing leader, whether you work for a leader who's a horrible leader, it does not matter. You have control over that situation, okay? And this is what we teach women when we work with them. You always have control over the situation, okay? But first, you got to rewire yourself because if you are walking into any situation from a place of 
feeling compulsed about your work and that work is what gives you value and it's what drives you, then you're already in a weakened position. Already, like the cards of negotiation are already stacked against you, okay? So what you have to understand is that the sacrifices that you're making and as an achiever, while it feels really good to achieve, and it does, I mean, it, it physically feels good, right? It feels good to get that one last email off. It feels good to get that presentation finalized. It feels good to, um, you know, finally give the, the, the big speech or whatever it is, you know, like that stuff is a high. It truly is an addiction. It feels great. And as long as that's where you're getting your value and your satisfaction and you're getting the high and, you know, being home with the kids or hanging out with your hubs while you want to do all that stuff, you know, going to the gym to work out, it just doesn't feel as good for achievers in many times. Um, a lot of times that stuff is just like the fluffy stuff that we do if we have time afterwards. So one of the first things you have to realize is that you can change this. Okay. You can change this. You can actually get a high from having the good life a balanced, rich, fulfilling life that you create your own success where you're navigating your environment really effectively, when that starts charging you and you're like, that's what I want. Now what happens is we can use our achievement personality to our advantage while also rewiring it so that rather than looking at achievement as a way that drives us, that drives value in our esteem, we look at achievement as just possibilities. Look at me. I am capable of great things. Huh. Let me go see if I can make this possible over here. Look at me. I am deserving of great things. Huh. Let me go see if I can make this possible over here. That's all it is. And the whole time what we're doing is we're just navigating whatever environment we're in, whatever leader we're working for and saying, hey, look, I now understand that in order to be an achiever, I need to achieve from a place of optimal well-being. I need to achieve from a place of being balanced. I need to achieve from a place of being empowered versus achieving because I'm just pushing through and getting it done, burning myself out, collapsing, and then coming back again. And we, we achievers, that's a hard thing for us to let go of, right? Because it's almost like armor. It feels good. Like, look at me, like I'm tough. And I know that sounds really silly because no one really wants to admit that, but it is, it's a badge of honor to say, you know what? When everyone else gets bowled over, I, I'm the last man standing. That always feels amazing, right? And that's ego. It's ego and esteem. But what we want to do is we want our ego and esteem to be wired to believe that we're capable of anything and that we can create the environment we want. And when you start dialing your ego and achievement, and, and achievement scripts or achievement um, compulsion into that, that's super exciting. That's where freedom comes from. That's where you get the key to the gilded cage and go... Okay, let's unlock the cage and let's start doing things in a different way where we can start working and living from a place of possibility, of freedom, of having control, of saying, wait a minute, yes, I am an achiever. And what I'm achieving today is some amazing autonomy for myself. What I'm achieving today is I am achieving some balance and connection with my husband. What I'm achieving today is putting a little bit more into my cup so that I can come back tomorrow and give what I need to give and be clear, creative, and concise and have a ton of impact. And achievers forget this because it feels so good to get that one last email done. It feels so good to be called to get on that airplane, even though you're exhausted and you've already been getting on airplanes, you know, every week, six months in a row. So what we have to start doing is recognizing that achievement comes from a place of deep inner um, rewiring that needs to help us establish our ego in a way that's different than it's established in the world around us. The world around us has taught you from a very young age that you are valuable for what you do. Oh, look, honey, you got an A plus on your paper or you got an A. Mm, too bad you didn't get an A plus. You know, wow. If you achieve a little bit more, if you try a little bit harder, you'll get an A plus. The difference between A and A plus probably not life-threatening, but you know, we hear this all the time, or if you work hard enough, and if you do this, and if you do this, you will be successful. And yes, certainly things that we do, do lead to success. But if that is your value equation for yourself, that's different. How often in our culture do we say, hey, what'd you do to fail today? I know that everyone's probably heard the Sarah Blakely story, right? Like she used to come home from school every day and her dad would say at the dinner table, how did you fail today? We don't do that. Failure is not an option. Failure should be an option every single day. 
but I won't get too far off the beaten path on failure. But the point is, is that as a high achiever, what's really happening is you're just trying to fill that cup of esteem over and over again. And because esteem cannot truly be fed through achievement, it just can't. I know it feels like it does in the moment, but that's what keeps you on this cycle of this hamster wheel. It's like the never, it's like a bottomless cup, right? So we're just, we keep pouring achievement into this cup of ego or of esteem. And it, why, why is it never working? Well, because it doesn't work that way. That's not how you rewire yourself, right? The way you meet your esteem is by understanding that you're valuable and capable and that life is, a, is, a, is about po creating possibilities for yourself and those around you. So how do you apply that to your job? Well, if your company or your boss or whoever is asking for ridiculous deadlines or impossible deadlines, or they're making comments nine times out of 10, what happens? We just had this whole conversation um, in our client group. Nine times out of 10, what's really driving achievers is someone's made a comment. Hey, I think you missed the mark. Hey, I don't think that was quite good enough. Hey, what did you know? Mm, I didn't really like that. And then all of a sudden we go into achievement over mode because what we interpreted that conversation as being is you aren't good enough. You didn't do a good enough job. And then we go into achievement over mode. We have to just work, 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 right? Or we go into achievement over mode because it has to get done by midnight tonight. Um, who was I talking to not too long ago? Oh gosh, I can't remember. It was probably a client. And they were saying that someone asked them to get like, there was sort of like this mass communication that went out and said like, hey, all hands on deck. We need such and such done by Friday at noon or whatever. And they were working towards this deadline, like stayed up like three nights in a row, worked 24 seven, you know, just pushed family off to the side once again, um, no health, you know, just like not working out. She was just like, oh my gosh. And she said, you know what? We got to Friday at noon and the leadership team said, oh, you know what? We're not ready for this. We're going to reschedule for next week. <laughs> but the achiever would never in a million years dream of going back to that leadership team and saying, hey, I think we need to rescope this, or at least our part's not going to be ready Friday at noon. You know, our part's going to be ready Wednesday, you know, the following Wednesday at four or whatever. But the achiever says, I can't do that because in order to be valuable, I have to always meet the deadlines, the targets, the way someone asked me to do something. I always have to dot every I and cross every T. And the reality is, is that may not actually be the best way to approach that problem, right? Achievers can't see that. Or the achiever has to be involved in everybody, you know, micromanaging. Or the achiever has to be the one who takes on every single assignment, or if not, my career is going to implode. Versus going, your career's not going to implode. Your career's going to be just fine. It's okay to sit one out. It's okay to say, I'm not getting on this airplane. I'll be there for go-to meeting. We have one client who um, was working with a startup. Oh, you know how startups are. You know, they grind you up and spit you out, right? Like there's the fallacy there. And the headquarters is in Asia. And when we first started working together, she, was, she had said, I'm not going to be traveling a lot. She put up a boundary. You guys know how I feel about boundaries. They don't work. And of course, what happened? Achiever mindset. She gets into the company, starts working. Oh, we need you over here. Okay, I'll take that trip. Okay. And before you knew it, she was all spun up, taking all sorts of trips. Her spouse was like, what's the point? Why are we doing this? I don't get it. Like I'm a single dad. Kids were like, what's your name? Are you mom? You know, the whole nine yards. Like you guys know this drill, right? It's really familiar. And what she started realizing was that this was all her doing. <laughs> Nobody said you have to be on an airplane. And so once we helped her rewire and realize that compulsion to always prove herself. And if I don't go, what are they going to think of me? And if I'm not there, will I not be doing a good job? That, that achiever compulsion. We said, look, that is you creating this. That is an internal conversation that you're subconsciously having with yourself. Your value is in what you're delivering. How you do it is up to you. You get to navigate that. And so now today they're like, hey, we're getting ready to have a board meeting. You know, it's going to be in, I can't remember, you know, Korea. And she's like, oh, great. I'll be on go-to meeting. <laughs> <laughs> right now, sometimes she goes right. Sometimes she'll take a trip or whatever, but it's on her terms. And again, if you had asked her a year ago and said, Hey, can you cut down your travel? Oh no, I work for a startup and oh my God, it's like really demanding. And we're just trying to get series, whatever funding. And you know, there's a thousand different external reasons why she could not cut back on her travel today. She still has her job. She's still working out of her home super flexible and it's all okay because it is how the wiring happens. And so I want to make sure that everyone understands that, you know, having, putting off the good life, putting off, enjoying your marriage, putting off, enjoying motherhood, putting off, enjoying your health and, and really feeling fit and firm and excited about, you know, how you look in your clothes or whatever, feeling that, Hey, Andrea, feeling like, um, that you're living the life you want, that you get to enjoy the perks of, you know, whatever career it is that you have, 
that does not have to come at a cost. Okay. And we have way, way, way too many women who are rising up the ranks of the corporate ladder and holding on to these really fierce, amazing jobs from a place of fear because they are achievement junkies, just as I was. And look, we can achieve through fear at a very high cost, or we can achieve through possibility. And when you achieve through possibility, now you get to decide when you're leaning in, when you're leaning out, how to optimize your needs, how to get your needs met, and how to help everyone else get their needs met without you having to sacrifice yourself in the meantime, okay? The power of human behavior is amazing when you understand how you're wired, the last thing I will say is that as you look at this value equation of your ego, it is not enough to simply tell yourself, it doesn't matter if I go on that business trip or not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about my value. It's okay. It'll be okay. And then we go out for wine night with the girls and we go, I'm not going on a business trip. I feel really bad about this. And the girls go, oh, it's okay. And you're like, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So what happens is we stay very up here, like in this sort of logical, like it shouldn't really matter but we don't feel it because inside the achiever is still wired to be freaking out that you're not achieving because you didn't go on the business trip. So you have to get below the surface and discover where that comes from and drive out that emotion. Because as long as you're feeling that emotion, that compulsion, that guilt, the fear, that emotional piece, and you're just trying to like squelch it down with willpower and these logical little like platitude sayings, it doesn't work or it doesn't work for very long. And this is why like women will say all the time, like, Ooh, I was doing pretty good. And then bam, everything exploded. And then, you know, for a while I sort of dialed back things and then bam, here I am again. And it's like, well, because we're, we're working on things on the surface level versus down below. And so when you get down below and realize, why do you really care so much about achieving? What emotional value does that have? What does that say to you and your value as a person and your, your capability and capacity and if you recognize you're driven by fear, it's the fear that we have to uproot and get rid of. And I see this all the time. One of our clients had shared this uh, really cool article. that was about being like an, in, I think it was like called an insecure achiever. Fantastic. Like I love how science and research is starting to sort of, you know, I don't know if it's catch up, but we're starting to mesh with some of the things that we're seeing, you know, in the corporate world for wellness. But the, the article went on to say that you can be an insecure achiever. Like not every achiever is this big, bold, brash, in your face, super confident person. A lot of us have like imposter syndrome and things like that, right? But sadly, where, where science can fail is with the execution. So science can help us understand why we're wired that way. But then what do you do about it? And, and this article was lovely. I'll have to see if I can pull it out and, and share it. But it was so lovely in the research and it was so accurate there. But then when it came to like, what do you do about this? Like, how do you uproot it? It was, well, just don't think about that or just change your mindset or, you know, just look at things from a different way. And it's sort of like being on a diet and going like, well, just don't eat chocolate cake. And it's like, but I want chocolate cake. What do I do on those nights? I really want chocolate cake. Give me the strategy to stop wanting the chocolate cake. That's what I need. And so that's what the piece you have to understand. If you're going to break this addiction to achievement, you have to break the addiction. It's the emotional piece that has to be dealt with, not a bunch of surface level strategies. If not, we stay in a gilded cage. And unless that cage, that nice little gilded cage is giving us permission to take a break, then we just stay in the gilded cage. We stay on the hamster wheel and we just keep going and going and going and going because we've never dealt with the emotional piece, which says, if you don't do these things a certain way, you're not valuable, you're not capable. So I hope that makes sense. It's been really delightful um, sharing with you guys today and, and hopefully motivating and incentivizing and, and inspiring everyone to understand that there really is a different way to work, okay? And we do not have to sacrifice our happiness um, for our livelihood. You can be super successful. You can carry on in huge corporations with huge jobs. There's plenty of evidence of that possibility, um, but you have to look for it because it's few and far between. And I think if more women share this message and the more of us get out there and say, look, look, you can do this differently, right? This doesn't have to be this way. I think we can really um, retain a lot more top talent um, and top executive women in the executive ranks, as well as just overall happiness, whether you're an executive or not, just women being fulfilled as working mothers or you know, working spouses or working women in the workplace. Um, it shouldn't be, I'm gonna work, 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 work and sacrifice, sacrifice myself. So someday when I get to retirement, I can live my life. And it's like, well, 
well, what are you going to do then? Like <laughs> we've been one dimensional for 25 years, right? So we really want to make sure that we're living life in the moment because I think we all appreciate the fact that those moments are few and far between. We don't get a lot of moments strung together in life. So we got to live it now and smell the flowers along the way, the roses along the way. Um, thank you guys again for, for being here. Um, again, if you are a high achieving woman and you are um, in your stock, right? And you are ready to, to start living a life of peace, of happiness, of freedom, to get control over your career so you can enjoy the fruits of your labor, then I suggest you book a call with us, right? We'll just talk about what's going on for you. Uh, we'll see what the root causes are. If it's something that we can help you with, we'll give you a game plan. Um, and it's a lot of fun. You know, it's 45 minutes of really getting to focus on you and your career and what some of the possibilities could be. Um, to book that call, you would just go to Kathleen Byers, that's B-Y-A-R-S.com forward slash session, S-E-S-S-I-O-N. And, um, and yeah, and just get on our calendar and, um, um, and let's chat and, you know, and let's help you get to the bottom of what's going on for you so you can start living your best life without having to sacrifice your career or your happiness. All right, guys, it's been great broadcasting with you today. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.